to start the day and then and then you can go uh, just a few words to introduce uh, Erika Abram that um, she will start the second day um, of Gandalf Erika uh, got uh, his PhD at Leiden in the Netherlands and she is now full professor at uh, um, RWTH Aachen where she directs the group uh, um, of theory of hybrid systems. His research is mainly in uh, modeling synthesis and analysis of hybrid and probabilistic systems and on uh, SMT solving. And today uh, she will present some uh, uh, recent work on probabilistic hyperproperties. So thank you, Erica, for accepting our invitation and uh, the audience is yours now. Thank you and welcome everyone. So what I would like to talk today is probabilistic hyperproperties. I will tell you short what it is. Um, before I would like to mention my collaborators, uh, Borzo, Oyandrila and Ezio, with whom together we work and still work on this really interesting topic. So let us start with uh, some motivation. What you probably all know, uh, from logic um, in modeling, the most simple, perhaps the most simple models that we can make are state-based models of a system. That means um, the system can be in different states and transitions between the states model state changes. And because the states are just nodes in a set, um, we add labels labeling to the states in order to somehow encode certain properties of the states over which we would like to specify some properties and also verify those properties later. So if you look at this very simple state model, it is a non-deterministic one. That means the successors that can be chosen non-deterministically. Um, we can use proposition logic to describe its states proposition with the propositions A and B. But what in execution we are more interested in is, well, executions. So how the systems evolve over time. And for that, the notion of um, computation trees has been established. That means that we start in a certain state. For example, if you look at here on the left, we have the state S1. And then non-deterministically, we can choose successors being S1 by the self-loop or going to S2 with the other decision. And if the initial state also is also non-deterministic, in this model, I can start S1 or S2, then basically I have two different computation trees depending on the initial state. And what you probably also know is now we want to describe properties of such computation trees. And for that, the notion of trace properties was um, introduced. So a trace, it depends on in which community it, you are, what a trace is. Let us now assume a trace is a sequence of states. And we consider infinite sequences that means infinite executions. So a trace is basically a sequence of states S0, S1, S2, and so on. And now a trace property is somehow a set of traces with some commonalities. So let us say a trace property is a set of traces and a trace satisfies this property if it is in the set. And then such a state-based model with the trace set, let's say Q, satisfies a trace property P if all of its traces is in the trace property set. And this is a very general definition. Now in praxis, we need something more handy to specify properties, not as traces, but somehow more, no, trace sets directly, but somehow more symbolically. And for that, Temporal logics have been developed. And I do not dwell long because I assume that most of you also know temporal logics. 
but just to recall, so the operators, temporal operators that are introduced for describing past properties are uh, the next operator. I mean, a proposition A is clear, a past satisfies a proposition A if it holds at the very beginning. Then the next operator, so now we move towards evolution. It is satisfied by a past if after one step the property is satisfied. So these are just example properties. <clears throat> then the until operator, A until B is satisfied if A holds uh, until after a finite number of steps B gets valid. Finally, is actually a syntactic sugar. It means that after a finite number of steps B gets valid. Then globally means the property holds always on the past. And then we can have, can define further syntactic sugar. There are logics which define um, in the time backwards, so past operators and so on. But this is the basic idea. And then based on these um, syntactical language definitions, we can express trace properties like, for example, I never start working before having a coffee. Here you can see the definition as a set of traces. This is a set of all traces such that at all positions in the trace, if I work, then previously there was a position where there had been coffee. And another example is after having a coffee, I always start working di directly, where the past property is the set of all passes such that at all positions, if I have coffee, then in the next position, I will work. And now these trace properties we can express in temporal logics, like in LTL, that is the linear temporal logic. It would look like either globally not work, so if I never work, I don't need coffee. Otherwise, I will not work until I get coffee. And similarly for the second property, it is always the case globally that if I have coffee, then after one time step in the next state, I will work. So why do I tell you all that, uh, which you probably, which is probably not the new information for you, is because this talk is about an extension of temporal logic. So to motivate, uh, why are we not happy with all that, uh, what is already there, is because these classical temporal logics are not expressive enough to express everything. And what is not expressible in this style of temporal logic is it always compares passes that start in the same state. So I can say from a given state, if I continue, then something is possible. Or never mind what I do all the time, some invariant will be true. But what I cannot do is to take a system, make several experiments with it, and compare the outcomes. That means classical trace properties cannot express relations between traces. But we need that these um, relations between traces in certain contexts. For example, in security, it is mostly relevant. In information flow security, there is something that one would like to have is non-interference. So assume that, um, that we have a, a system and it will have some input, a high input, and a low input. And the high means that it is a secret. So this one is a secret input. And this one is a normal globe observable input. And then I do my system and I get some observations. And I can also have a, a secret output, but what is more interesting is the low output. That means the um, publicly observable output. And non-interference means that this output here might not depend on the secret input, 
Okay, so just observing the publicly observable part of the input and output does not let me to make any conclusion to the secret. And if the system is, for example, non-deterministic, then just having one pass, looking at one pass, or looking at several passes but do not relating them, does not allow me to express such properties. Another example is declassification. This is a bit weaker than non-interference. This means that certain part of the secret input can be observed, but certain other part not. A good example is if you enter a password somewhere, then it is observable whether the password was correct or not, but it is not observable what the password itself is. Okay, so we have some, um, some observable part that we allow to get known to the public and some not. Then non-inference is also a bit weakening means that um, if I have some secret input and the system has some behavior, if I replace this secret input by a dummy, then I cannot observe any change. And observable, observational determinism is also a similar property <clears throat> that means that if we have non-deterministic models, then the non-determinism is somehow in the execution need to be uh, resolved by a scheduler. And observational determinism means that the outcome that I can observe is independent of what scheduler I take. All these properties have in common that they cannot be expressed by just looking at traces or trace sets, but I need to compare traces. <clears throat> Another um, source of need for comparison between traces is, for example, linearizability. Means if you have a concurrent model, then the linear linearizability means that there exists an equivalent sequential model where we can observe the same properties. And eventual causal cons consistency means that um, if there is a cause and an effect, then basically the probability that the event happens um, is um, larger than um, if the cause was not be there. So I just switched to, to probabilistic uh, part. But before I do that, um, what we need here is named hyper property. And hyper is a bit meta. That means it is not a set of traces as before, but it is a set of set of traces. And within these sets, uh, we have the comparisons between traces enabled. And this is not our work. There have been developed hyper temporal logics or temporal logics for hyper properties. For example, hyper LTL or hyper CTL star. And the main component that is added there is quantification of the passes. So I can say, for example, for each two passes in the system, if they start in some low equivalent states, then the output, uh, visible output will be also the same, something like this. And the system satisfies a hyper property if its trace set is in the hyper property set. So if one of, um, one of these sets is then the trace set of the model. Okay, so this is basically what was there before we started our work. And then um, I already talked about observational non-determinism. So sometimes probabilistic um, decisions come into play and this happens very often in security. So a lot of security protocols involve some probabilistic 
randomized decisions. So what happens when we move to, um, to probabilistic systems and where are they where we perhaps even not expect them to be? So consider as a motivation the, this very simple program and this has a high input H and a low output L. So it takes an input, a secret input, and gives a publicly observable output. And what it does is, it is two threads that run in parallel. The first thread on the left first takes the secret input and decreases it by one until it reaches the value zero, and then set the low output, the observable, to two. And the second thread just sets the low input, the low output to one. So if I run them in parallel, what we are used to think of is the set of all possible outcomes. The low can be one or two. Okay, so both things can happen depending on which thread terminates first. So the first thing we should we could think of, well, the value of the secret input is not observable, okay? Because the second thread made somehow the, the um, activity of the first thread um, hidden. But when we execute it in practice, then there will be a scheduler. And these schedulers are sometimes also probabilistic. So assume now we have a uniform probabilistic scheduler. That means at each time it um, throws a coin between the two processes if they are not yet terminated and one of them will be chosen with 50% probability. So what happens now if we have such a uniform scheduler? Assume that we start with the secret input zero. That means first uh, this comparison, this uh, condition will be checked and because it is false, the low will be assigned to two. So it is two steps to be done here. And here it is just one step. And because at each choice, each process has 50% chance to execute, we get the probabilities that in the first step, the um, the um, first process will be executed with 50% and the second one with 50%. So with 50%, we have already this value because if this one terminates first, the other one by terminating will override the result, right? And then if the in the first step, the first thread executes. Then again, for the second thread, we again throw a die. So it will get a farther 25% that the law is true, uh, is two. And with the remaining probability is the law is one. Okay, what happens now if we change the value of H? Then the execution of the left program is longer. So the probability that the left one terminates first gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if we take for the secret input the value five, then we even get a very, very small probability for the low value to be one. That means an observer, an attacker, could observe the value of H by observing these probabilities, but only if it, so what we usually know is we have a system start somewhere and then we observe the output. But now, it can start at the same time at several paces and compare these outputs or compare the traces themselves. And this is what we cannot express in temporal logic, but in hyper logic. But now we need to add probabilities to this logic in order to be able to argue about randomized systems. So we will have probabilistic hyper properties which will express probabilistic relations between independent executions of a system. So you can really imagine like an attacker, it will try to find out what the system does. So it makes several experiments with the system 
and remembers the outcomes such that at the end, the attacker can combine the outcomes, can make statistical, um, statistical observations about probabilities, and then it can perhaps make some conclusion regarding the secret. And here in the logic, we then let all these parallels run, sorry, all these experiments, all these plays with the system, we let them run in parallel. Everything what I want to observe, I observe in parallel such that at the same time, I can compare what I can observe in the different experiments. So for example, probabilistic non-interference, now we can talk about what it would be. So remember non-inference was that different secrets cannot lead to different publicly observable behavior. So probabilistic non-inference, non-interference now says that the probabilities, so if I have two states with different secrets, but the same um, observable inputs, then the behavior probabilistically the same. That means that the probabilities of certain things happening or not is the same independently of the secret value. Okay, so we need a logic, a probabilistic hyperlogic. And of course, we do not want to break with all the tradition. We would like to extend what is there because that is already proven to be useful, to be um, also in praxis useful to express things. So we can ask ourselves which temporal logics are best suited for hyperextensions in the probabilistic direction. And basically the mostly known probabilistic logic is PCTL. It is probabilistic computation tree logic in which we can argue uh, that the probability of um, a um, past property, a probability, for example, that phi one holds until phi two holds is compared to a certain bound. So for example, is, um, let me give you something concrete, is less so it will 0 0.5, okay? And then I can make Boolean combinations of this. So usually this less so equal 0 0.5, people write here. And we can make Boolean combinations of these and we can also nest them. So I can also write the probability that um, A holds until the probability is um, larger or equal 0 0.1 or something like that. This way, I can, I can argue about one computation tree. I start in a certain state and I can argue about what happens when I continue these executions. But remember that we wanted to compare different executions. So if we wanted to extend PCTL, then um, somehow we need to add this choice of initial states. And PCTL will be okay. This is what we ex will basically extend. LTL is not so well suited because LTL, as the name says, is linear. That means it argues about traces, but the probability, um, probabilistic behavior means we have in a certain state and then we have a distribution for example, to get to this state with probability 0 0.1, here with 7 and here with 2, this is more uh, branching-like. So I cannot talk about single passes, but I can talk about the probability that something happens. So that's why PCTL is more well suited, and that's why we have taken it and extended it to hyper-PCTL. And what was missing and what we added is a quantification over where we start the experiments. We will see in a minute how it looks like. Before that, I just give you an example that you can uh, have an impression how it looks like. So I have a system and I can start 
several experiments. And these are the quantifiers represent the experiment starting point. So if I start in S or in S prime, if I both labeled by init, so both are kind of initial states. And now I need to talk about in which experiment I want to name the labels and I add them basically as an index on the atomic propositions. So that means for all pairs of states, if the first state S is labeled within it, and the second state S prime is also labeled within it, and the high secret values in them are different, so this could be added by another label, this is here a bit informal, and even not needed, strictly speaking. Then if I make now here experiments, from these two states, assume the model is deterministic, that means I have only probabilistic aspects in the behavior, then I will have different outcomes. So this is outcome one, outcome two, outcome three. Then what probabilistic non-inference says that the probabilities of these are pairwise the same. They have equal probabilities independently of where I start, if the low observable input is the same, then the observable output will be the same with the same probability. Okay, so after this uh, intuition, let us look at the syntax and semantics. So how can we define it? So first to the syntax, PCTL, probabilistic computation tree logic has um, as a reminder, we can have atomic propositions for state formulas, or we can have disjunctions and negations to have the Boolean structure. And we have the probability that a past property holds satisfies certain bounds. These are the state formulas. And then for the past formulas, we have basically uh, the next and the until. And it is PCTL, so it, it is not so much uh, compute, not so much branching like probabilistic. So basically this one, replaces the universal and existential quantifiers for all and exists in CTL by a probabilistic uh, statement over the successors. But they share with CTL that the probabilistic operators and the temporal operators are alternating. So from this, now we extend it to hyper and the hyper basically quantifies over initial states. So I, I assume we have a normal form when the quantifier are all in the beginning. We can always bring it to this, it formula to this normal form. It's easier to think of. So we can quantify over the initial states. And then the property that compares different executions is atomic propositions with a label that tells us in which experiment I talk about this label. Note that it is not the state label where I am, but if I state an experiment from S and an experiment from S prime, then AS means in the first copy, in the first experiment at a certain position A holds, and AS prime means at a certain position in the second copy, in the second experiment. Uh, the proposition holds. And then as in CTL and PCTL, I have Boolean structure and I can talk about probabilities. And whereas in PCTL, we can only compare probability of an expression to a constant, we allow a bit more, we allow an arithmetic of probabilities. 
So this is what we know from PCTL. And I can basically, PCTL has only this compared to a constant. And instead now we can also say that the probability of something equals the probability of something else. This is not possible in PCTL. Um, and what remains to say is the probability of something. So what are past formulas? And this is basically the same as in uh, CTL and PCTL. So the temporal properties are defined by the operators next until and bounded until. Whereas the operators of the temporal formulas are again state formulas. Yeah, so we have again alternating probability and temporal operators. This is the same like in PCTL. But the main difference is firstly that we have quantification. So we can have several experiments at the same time and compare directly the outcomes. And that we have some arithmetic over the probabilities instead of just comparing them to constant. Okay, so I will show you an example, but before I come to that, I would like to mention something important. Is the uh, is the difference? So why uh, do we allow arithmetic operations? And basically, in PCT, we could, we could also add them. It would not hurt those who you who know how we can compute the truth of PCTF formulas is basically that we compute those probabilities and compare to them constant. And we can compute those probabilities in DTMCs. So if we have no non-determinism for deterministic models, it is not a problem to compute them. The problem is decidable. So we could add there also arithmetic. What gets more dirty and hard and undecidable is if we move to non-deterministic models, to MDPs. And I guess that that was the reason why this arithmetic was not introduced in PCTL to remain on the safe side and keep the problems, the model checking problems, decidable. But at this stage, for deterministic models, we can add them safely and we the, the logic still remains decidable. Okay. So an example, this formula says that never mind where I start in a state S1, there exists another state S2 in which I can kind of simulate the behavior from S1. That means that the probability that I reach a label A from S1 is the same than the probability to reach the label B when I start from S2. Okay, and this is something which we cannot express in um, PCTL. So here also one side remark. Um, if I have DTMCs with a finite set of states, then these quantifiers are syntactic sugar. Because I could say that for, for all states, one of the states will fit. So, we can build the, what we call self-composition. I take the same model twice and build them in parallel. And then I could define basically a PCTF formula over that self-composition that is equivalent to this formula. But hyper-PCTF is more expressive because sometimes, um, sometimes, I do not know um, the exact property 
that should hold for both copies. Sometimes I just want to say there is no observable difference. For example, if I say that, um, never mind, if I state in two different states, then the number of observed A labels will be the same. I don't know how many A labels will come. And I can define these properties in height of PCTL, but I cannot define them without hyper. Okay, and beside that, if you have a few millions of states, then you do not want to build these conjunctions and these junctions. But theoretically, uh, for this property, they are syntactic should. Okay, so now <clears throat> a bit more formal. So what is a discrete time mark of chain? I just recall it in case someone, some of you are not uh, familiar with this. So it basically has as all state-based models, a finite set of states. And what you know from the state-based models, what we had before is transitions between the states. And um, here we do not consider any initial states because we want to experiment with the model from different starting points. But instead of non-deterministic successors, we have now probability distributions over the successors. Okay, so here we have a set of states. This so-called transition probability function defines the probabilities. So for each pair of states S, S prime, this probability function gives us the probability to get from S to S prime. And then we have again a set of atomic propositions to in, increase the, or to enable the specification of properties. And we have a labeling function that assigns to each state a set of atomic propositions from the atomic proposition set. Okay, and um, here you see an example. And uh, now assume that I want to say a hyper property about, about this model and the hyper <laughs> and the hyper property has two quantifiers. That means I execute this model from two different initial conditions. And if I have two different initial conditions, you can imagine that I to make two experiments. And in order to compare them in the logic, I need to execute them simultaneously, the two experiments. So I build a parallel composition. And that is what we call the self-composition of the DTMC because I take the same model several times. And this is what we know from DTMC parallel composition. We will have for a model with n states, n times n states. And here I made it a bit smaller because we want to start from S1, from the initial state, I depicted only those, that part of the composition, which is reachable from S1, S1. Okay, and now we can define it also formally, just very fast. What is the self-composition? If we have the energy self-composition of a DTMC, then the state set is n states from the product. So we will have basically from the system n copies running. And in each, we are in a certain state. Here we are in state S1, here we are in state S2, and so here currently in Sn. Then a state in the global composition will have n components. The ice component describes <clears throat> where we are in component i. And then the probabilities are given if I'm in one model and go with probability one to a certain state and with the rest to somewhere else. Let's say this is state S1. 
and another state S2 in the model, oh sorry, um, this was the wrong place. <clears throat> that if the system in the first experiment is in S1 and in the second experiment is S2 and both experiments run in parallel, so the probability that in the first experiment I take the given transition and at the same time I take in the second experiment the P2 transition will be of course P1 times P2, right? And this is what is said here. This is a transition in the self-composition. The probability for a certain uh, setting is given by the product of the probabilities of the steps in the local experiments. And now if I have, again, these models that run in parallel and it has states inside, right? And some states have labels. So for example, this one has here label A. Now if say label A, then it is not clear what I mean. So we will put, instead of that, we will put an index in order to be able to talk about which copy I mean. Sorry, this is two. We will add a label to the atomic propositions and then define the state labeling. If I'm here in state S in the first copy and state, mm, state S prime in the second copy, or I could have also written S1 and S2, it doesn't matter. And here is a label A and here's a label B, then in the self-composition, I will have a state S, S prime, uh, in which I have these two states together, and then it will be labeled with A in the first copy, and B for the second copy. Okay, so I collect the current pro propositions from all possible copies, from all experiments, but in order to, be, to identify them, I give them indices. Okay. So now we have the syntax. What does it mean? And sorry, we get here a bit formal, but uh, <clears throat> it is not much possible without formalisms in this area, but it is very easy. So that's what looks complicated, it's very easy. This one is our DTMC model. And this is the current state. We have a set of experiments started. At the beginning it is empty, but afterwards it will be already n experiments running. So now if we have a quantified formula, for example, for all states, something holds, then we start a new experiment. That means we will extend the copies with a new copy, start it in a certain state. And this formula says that never mind in which state we start, the property will hold. So I instantiate the initial state of this copy with each of the states and for each of them, the property behind the quantifier should hold. The same is or similar is for the existential quantification. And now basically the rest is um, very, very similar to PCTL. But we need to take the indices into account. So an atomic proposition AI is evaluated in the ice copy. Okay, so the label on the global state should be um, a label on the ice state. 
<clears throat> Condition and negation is straightforward, but note that not everything is basically evaluated in this self-composition. So I have really n times the model running and they run all concurrently and the concurrent running we will see by the temporal operators. So here, <clears throat> um, the basic case for beside as atomic propositions, we have for the state properties, of course, the comparison of probability expressions. And the probability expressions can be either a probability or arithmetic operations. The arithmetic operations are straightforward. I just recursively evaluate the operands and apply the operator. A bit interest, more interesting is the probability operator. <clears throat> and its value is the probability of the set of all passes in the self composition. That means all experiments run in parallel. And these common runs have a certain probability and all those passes that start in this state, and this is a global state, it has n components already, n states, one for each component where we start, and the probability of all such composed passes which satisfy the property phi, which is the operand of the probability operator, is a value, right? And this value will be then evaluated here, which is put into constraints over probabilities. And the only thing that remains to show is what is this here. And this is um, a temporary operator. So this one is a pass property. And we know pass properties are next or until and I just cover up. <clears throat> so the next, this is a global pass, a common run in all possible uh, experiments. And the next means all together make one step, each of them concurrently. And then after one step, I have again the operator satisfied. And the until is also the same. It is just that it is not evaluated in the DTMC, but in the self-composition. It says that this property holds if there exists a position J, here I start, here's a position J where the second operand holds, <clears throat> and all the time before the first, op uh, sorry, the first operand holds. So it is the same as for CTL, as for PCTL, just that now these runs are actually composed from one run in each of the experiments. They run simultaneously. And I can observe globally all runs at the same time. Okay, here's a small example. Um, I have in this uh, model two different initial states and I would like to, I, we already had this example, I would like to, like to say that never mind where I start, if, you, if I start in two initial states, then the probability to reach A will be the same. So the probability to reach A from S is the same as the probability to reach A from S prime. And this holds because the probability to reach A from S zero, so A holds here and there, is these two ways. So it is the probability 0 0.44 and the probability to reach um, A from S1 is these two ways. 
right? And this also sums up to 0 to 44. So never mind where I start, that what I can observe is the same. If I can observe only labels and the probabilities to visit them in a certain order. Okay. <clears throat> so now I don't have much time left. No. And in the remaining time, I would like to give you some examples, no. example formulas, and show very, very shortly how the model checking algorithm works. Because it is quite technical, but I can show you just the main idea. Okay, so examples. You know, by simulation. And probabilistic by simulation means you divide the state set into equivalence classes. And we can say that for each class, I have the property that the probability to get in the different successor states is the same for all states in a given, um, for all states in a given um, equivalence class. And this is what is expressed here. So assume that the different equivalence classes are labeled with A1 for the first class, we label them by A2 for the second class and so on. And I can say that for all pairs of states, if they are both in the same class, in the I's class, then they have the same labels. So I cannot distinguish them by their labels. And the probabilities to get to any of the other classes from the first one, from S, is the probability to get to the second class from S prime is the same. Uh, sorry. Okay. So probabilistic by simulation is something we can express <clears throat> in hyper-PCTR. Probabilistic non-interference we had already. If I start in two different states, both are initial, even if they differ in their secret, the probability to reach the same low output is the same. If I start in S or in S prime, the probability that the low output will be one is the same and the same holds for the other possible low, low output. Differential privacy. It means um, like sometimes we have these student evaluations. I mean, evaluations by the students. That means I have a, a lecture and <clears throat> the students should tell me how good they think the lecture is. And if there are less than 10 students, then the evaluations are not, not evaluated. They are not used for evaluation. Why? Because the probability that they might give the same answer and then I know for all of them what they answered is too high. And we do not want that someone who gives some information will have a negative impact from giving this information. This is differential privacy. And also this is a hyper property because we need to consider the, all the answers at once. Right? And I want to compare the answers because <clears throat> if all of them say the lecture is not good, or if I change just one answer, one of them says the lecture is good and all the others says the lecture is bad. Okay, it was the wrong example. I should say that all of say, of course, the lecture is very good. And one of them says it is not good. If just one of them says it is not good, then I don't know anything. I do not know who answered what. But if I switch this answer from bad to good, then I know everyone finds the lecture good. Okay, so differential privacy says, if I just change one single element, then the observation that I can make does not change. And because we cannot assure it's exactly 
sometimes people take epsilon differential. That means um, I do not want it to be exactly the same, the probability to observe something, but they differ in a constant. So that the difference between the two observations is bounded by a factor. And <clears throat> for example, sometimes to hide the exact answers to assure epsilon differential privacy, <clears throat> um, they make the protocols of answering questions random. For example, they flip a fair coin and it get they, if they get tail, then the answer truthfully. And if that they get head, <clears throat> then flip again and give an answer depending on the outcome. So fake answer. And this is a, a protocol where we get some information, but here the single opinions are hidden epsilon differentially private. Okay. So this protocol is actually LN3 differentially private. And here I don't have time to show in details, but we can model the different <clears throat> opinions. So this is the true answer uh, which the student or the participant would give. And then it flips a coin. For example, if the true answer is yes, with 50%, it will flip tail and answer truthfully and otherwise the answer depends on the outcome. And in order to prove that it is um, LN3 differentially private, we would need to analyze this formula. This says that for all states, if the answer that they would give, the true answer is different, then the probabilities between giving the same answer is bounded by this constant. And this property is symmetric. That means I can observe a probabilistic difference between the two cases, but this is bounded by a certain bound. And uh, if it is statistically slow enough, then I cannot make in praxis any conclusion anymore. And there's one more example is probabilistic causation. That means that I show you the formula. I can explain it on this. So if I start two observations, two experiments, and in the first experiment I start where a certain cause holds, then the probability that the effect happens is larger as if the cause would not be there. So in the first experiment I start from the cause and I check the, the probability. This is the probability that the effect will happen. And in the second one, I start a path where the cause does not happen and then the effect happens. And I say that the probability that the effect happens without the cause being there is less than the probability that the effect happens where the cause is there. And again, to compare these two, I need a hyper expressivity because I compare two different executions, one starting with the cause and one where the cause does not appear. Okay, very shortly, the model checking idea so as always in model checking, we will recursively check the truth of subformulas. But what is different here is if we have a DTMC model as input, then we will work model checking in the self composition. So I will have M in parallel N times if N is the number of quantifiers in my formula. And this is the bad news. Okay, and how does this recursive check of the subformulas happen here? Is where the case is for atomic proposition, for logical combination, and so is quite easy. Once the, the composition is built, the sample composition is built, it is the same as for 
normal model checking. <clears throat> and the probability is actually is also the same as for normal PCTL model checking, but in the composition. So for example, here to evaluate the comparison of two probability expressions, I evaluate them recursively. And then I apply the comparison operator to the evaluated expressions. Okay, and if it, the comparison operator is satisfied by the values, then I add <clears throat> this formula to the labeling to this, of the states. But what is different to PCTM model checking and to, uh, to normal model checking is that I always evaluate everything <clears throat> for all states and implicitly due to, uh, due to quantification also to all possible combinations of states. So really I do everything in the energy self composition. Okay. And here we have uh, the other cases for the temporal operators. So here the probability <clears throat> operator for the next, this is clear if I have a state and I have several successors and some of them phi holds and some of them not, then I will add up the probabilities of those where it holds and then I get the probability here from next phi or psi. And for the until case, <clears throat> it is the, the standard PCTM model checking, but in the self-composition. <clears throat> that means uh, I can set up a set of linear uh, equations and I can solve this equation system and then I can compute the probabilities uh, of until formulas. So here I don't go in here, I have an example which we already know, so it doesn't matter where I start, the probability of A will be the same. So I will build the self-composition, I will get something like this, <clears throat> and I apply then the labeling where I need to take care that I add the indices to know in which experiment these labels are currently true. <clears throat> and then if you look at the, these models uh, more in detail, then we see that this property that the pr probability to reach the label A is independent of where I start. And I can see it if I execute both experiments simultaneously. Okay, so the complexity of this model checking algorithm without having you the, give, given the details <clears throat> is polynomial in the size of the Markov chain but unfortunately, it is exponential in the size of the formula because we need to build the energy self composition. Good. A very short conclusion. So what I have shown you is what are hyper properties, what are probabilistic hyper properties, how we can formulate them in hyper PCTL, an extension of PCTL, and we have seen a few examples for cases where it is very meaningful to have these hyper extensions of probabilistic properties. And um, where the sad news is doesn't scale very well, but uh, we introduced also some improvements where we are currently working on to avoid the full um, generation of the self-composition. And what we also do is we work we worked on parameter synthesis. This was uh, published uh, this year by EPA and also extended this work when we have additional non-determinism. And then the idea is not only to quantify over states, but quantify also about over schedulers. And then the things get really interesting and powerful and then we definitely lose uh, decidability of these properties. So thank you for your attention. I am a bit over time, but I hope it is uh, still okay. Okay, thank you, Erika, for the talk.
So I think that we have maybe time for a couple of short questions, if there are any from the audience. So I have a question. Yes. So you, you mentioned at the, the end that, uh, I mean, for maybe a fragment of the logic, you don't need the self-composition. So, uh, so I was not able to, to get really the intuition why you need uh, the, the self-composition at all, because, I mean, there is no synchronization between the execution, right? So yes, there is. They are stepwise synchronous. So they do the step simultaneously. Yes. And that is very relevant because otherwise I could not, I could still talk about finally, right? Okay. Okay. That the probability that they reach something is the same, mm -hmm. but I could not talk, for example, that um, the number of steps, so. I can even count without telling how many. Mm -hmm. I can always say that they, they reach the label A the same number of times, okay. by which I define mm -hmm. recursively that they reach A at the same time. And in hyper, not probabilistic, but in hyper properties, there is an alternative semantics where they are not synchronous, but you can still say the same number of times by having these tau steps, these locus steps in between. Mm -hmm. So they either execute simultaneously or one makes an invisible step and the other one does not move. Okay. Like in by simulation, you have also the, the stutter thing in it. It is a bit similar. I see, yeah. Okay, so if you remove the next operator, then things are simpler. No, because it is already in the semantics that they are stepwise okay. compared. So really, I make an experiment, and after each step, I can compare where I am. I see. We make the steps, and at each point, after n steps, I, I can see, compare the states. Okay. 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 So I, it is not so expressive that I can compare the full passes at the same time. I cannot, so they make a step, then I can compare these two, but I cannot compare this with the previous one of, of the other. I see. Right? Mm -hmm. I can do a bit due to the temporal operators, but due to the expressions, I can all, always compare only the current state. And I do not have the global view of the whole passes, which would be even more expressive. Okay, thanks. Mm. Yes, I have a, a question again on this fact of synchronicity between the components. If you remove this constraint, what do you get? Uh, so so if, you allow, if you allow the, the two components to move with different speeds, you get something less expressive, more expressive, completely different? Or... Um, I cannot exactly say. I would say it is more expressive. I'm not fully sure. Definitely it is more complicated. Okay. So we, we, we thought about uh, whether, whether to do it or not, but uh, there one really needs to be careful what one allows and what not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question on the non-determinism. You say that the logic became undecidable. Do you have any, uh, I don't know, <laughs> future work to tackle this undecidability? I don't know what yes. the approximation so we, or simplify things. Yeah, we just published by Atva the, the non-deterministic extension. Mm -hmm. But, so, the problem is that uh, by non-determinism, you need to first consider which set of schedulers you, you want to allow or want to consider in the semantics of the formulas. And the luck for PCTL, why it is decidable, is that the, the semantics of PCTL formulas is the following. If you have a probability expression, then its meaning is given under for all schedulers. So if you say the probability that something happens is less than 0 0.5, then it is true if never mind what scheduler I take. Under all schedulers, the probability is at most 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5. 
That means if I would have the probability of something equals the probability of something under the MDP semantics, then both would be evaluated independently of all schedulers. And I would take basically the, the, the highest value or, or, yeah? So different probability expressions in a formula, even if you have several, they are evaluated completely independently under all schedulers. And that is like for linear, in, uh, for, um, for uh, integer arithmetic, where we lose decidability is being integer. And here for the schedulers, where we lose decidability is if we combine the different probability operator values under the same schedule, if they are bound under the same scheduler, there it gets undecidable. And therefore, we do not even need to go to hyper. If, I, if we change the PCTS semantics, not for all schedulers, but well, um, nested probability operators are evaluated under the same scheduler, then we lose, then it is also undecidable. So undecidability is not in hyper, but in, yeah, how we evaluate probability expressions. Sorry for the long explanation. It was, uh, yeah, it was clear, I think. Uh, may I ask a question? Of course. So uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned uh, that uh, methods that don't use self-composition. So is it uh, more about algorithms like on the fly, something like this, or more you restrict properties and restrict systems for which you can avoid self-composition? So the basic idea is um, that, um, I already stopped uh, screen sharing, <clears throat> that if I have a sub-formula, and in this sub-formula, not all copies are relevant. That means if I have the probability from the reach from the first state to reach A, it is completely independent what the second component is, right? So I do not need to label all n square states, but it is sufficient to label n states. And for the second component, which is irrelevant, I just take a reference state and consider only that and all the others are neglected in the labeling. So it is not, it does not improve complexity wise, it improves practice wise. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so seems that there are no other questions. So thank you again, Erika.